Thank you all for joining NeuroNoodles, Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast, featuring our neuropsychologists, Dr. Laura Jansen and Dr. Skip Wren. They've been practicing for over 50 years and are happy to share their knowledge with you. You can find Dr. Laura at Jansen's.com and Dr. Skip can be found at drskipwren.com. Today is a momentous day as we have the J. Bunkelman here today, and he's joining us as a co-host for the next few weeks. Jay is the Mr. Miyagi of Neurofeedback. He's mentored so many people in the field. Jay, thanks for joining us today. We're lucky to have you. My pleasure. And with Martine Arns as the guest, I couldn't avoid it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Jay, for the, for the new listeners out there, could you give a quick background uh, uh, about yourself? Because since this is the first show you're co-hosting with us. I'm the chief science officer for Brain Science International, and I'm old, uh, so I go back to the beginnings of most of this. Um, uh, I was the first uh, tech to be certified in quantitative EEG, 1996. That's a little bit of an odd circumstance since I wrote the exam. Uh, and uh, so I, I got certificate number one, um, but uh, uh, I, I completed over 500,000 EEG uh, processes uh, by the 1990s and quit counting at that point. And um, uh, uh, our guest today uh, actually greets me when, when I used to be able to travel and get to his office, he would greet me with stacks of EEGs. Uh, uh, 98 of them the first time I walked in, 49 ADD, 49 match controls. The next time I walked in, uh, 126 depressives and 126 match controls. So he knows how to greet me. He knows exactly what in entertains me. And uh, uh, he, he gave me good EEGs to look at right when I walked in. Well, we got a good guest. No wonder you, you said to put him on. Okay. Uh, please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the word out. If they can't hear us, we can't help them, guys. My name is Pete, and today we're going to chat with Martine Arns, Research Director of Brain Clinics Foundation. Again, Jay Gunkelman himself suggested to bring uh, Martine on the show a few weeks back. Martine, thanks for coming on the show today. Well, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Oh, well, it's early. It's early in the show. Plus, we got Jay in here. Who knows where we're going to go with Jay? Uh, speaking of Jay, how do you guys know each other? Jay, Martine, you guys seem like old buds. Uh, uh, Martine can uh, lead, lead this one off. Yeah, I think, think it's a long time ago. I mean, I tried to dig, dig up exactly where. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint, but somewhere early in the century. And I think it must have been one of the conferences where we ran into each other. I think probably one of Rob Cal's conferences. That was probably the first time we met the Future Health meeting or one of the ISNR conferences. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, Jay's name within the field was always, or, always floating around. So he was, his name was never far away when people would talk QEG or uh, EEG in general. Uh, so always had great respect for him. And then, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, after meeting often uh, over and over again, at some point in time at one of the conferences, I still recall that we, uh, uh, that there was one of my favorite bands was playing in the United States who never would come to the Netherlands, which is the Dave Matthews band, which is world famous in the US, as I know, uh, but not that, that much outside. So I was able to, to get some tickets on one of the conferences. Uh, so I asked the girl around like, hey, who, who's willing to go? And of course, Jay put up the finger and Cynthia Kirsten as well. And I think wait, which was... finger? Wait, which finger did he put up? <laughs> the right one. Okay, just okay. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Martin. Keep going. Yeah. So, so we went there, and it was actually in um, uh, what, what was it again? The um, uh, what's the big rock again? Where where the Red, rock is Red called? Rocks. Red Rocks, indeed. So it's a very unique location as well. So we went there uh, using a limo, and I think that was one of the most brilliant nights I've had. It's one of the best shows I've ever been to. So that was really like a, a great and fond memory uh, I hold there. So we were in the tenth row. Martine got some good tickets. <laughs> oh man, I wish I was in the eleventh row. So Mar Martine, how did how did you get started with neurofeedback, biofeedback, etc.? Give us a little background on on yourself. We got a, there's a mixture of technicians that listen to the show, parents that listen to the show. So we got, you know, the end user and the applicant. We have, we have both sides on here. So feel free to address both. Yeah. No worries. 
I, a little bit of background might be relevant here. So I, I studied psychology and I, I got a master's in, in, in biological psychology. And so don't expect me to be the talkative and listening kind of a psychologist guy. But uh, my main interest has always been um, how, to, how can we more objectively grasp behavior and pathology, but also with the main purpose to, to improve treatments and understand brain processes better. And so my interest has always been coming from the biological uh, aspect. So therefore, I've never been a big fan of the DSM-4 or 5 or the ICD. And so the standard descriptions we use in psychiatry, like depression and ADHD, yes, we need to use them because reviewers will not uh, understand otherwise. But we know it's a very poor proxy. And we know that behavior is not mapping very well onto neurobiology. And so that's why I think neurobiology is probably a much more important avenue where to go. Actually, my main topic is not neurofeedback. Many people know me for the neurofeedback work we've done, but actually my big hobby project is uh, what we call, used to call personalized or precision medicine at trying to individualize treatments to the individual. Uh, I will talk maybe a little later a bit more about what I call stratified psychiatry, which is my new conceptualization of it. Uh, and, as, and on that journey where we wanted to use EEG and imaging techniques to match the right treatment to the right patient, of course, neurofeedback came along quite early. Yeah, because with neurofeedback, not being a psychiatrist, uh, that was a technique where you can use the EEG not only to optimize treatment, but also in this real-time feedback process where the brain is, is, is part of that, that feedback process, you can actually uh, yeah, help people to quite a big extent already. So we're not using language as, as the communication medium, but we're using the EEG in order to, uh, to directly tap into brain networks uh, and optimize uh, brain function to that extent. Uh, so the first kind of um, time I got across it was 97, 98. Uh, there was more coming from biofeedback to neurofeedback. And I think especially in the beginning, uh, exactly 20 years ago, uh, as of this day, uh, when we started with Brain Clinics, uh, we came across it on the various conferences where we also, where also met uh, Jay Gunkman. So, and there, yeah, it sounded like a very natural kind of extension of the work we did. And, and what is Brain Clinics? Yeah, that's a good question. I think... Uh, <laughs> Many of my colleagues in research and researchers ask me that question as well. When I explain it to them quite often, you seem like, oh, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. Now, so Brain Clinics is actually a private research institute. We started out a long time ago as an extension, more or less, to the brain resource company who were collecting and setting up the biggest brain database of the whole world. And we're still very thankful to that and, and uh, yeah, using a lot, lot of the data that was collected. Um, so we started to do applied research, but the reason why I started brain clinics, because I came out of biological psychology, often it was animal research as well, uh, but I think you need to have a better translation to human and to make an impact for patients. So while having worked there for a while and having embarked on a very fundamental PhD in pharma, uh, the pharma industry, I actually came to realize that I want to do something that can benefit patients tomorrow, not within a year and other people might know, I'm a very inpatient kind of guy. Uh, so the translational aspect, we need to be able to do it pragmatic and as quickly as possible, uh, because there's many patients out there needing uh, appropriate care and appropriate help. Uh, so that was my main mission at Brain Clinics. Uh, our main saying is from uh, ne applied neuroscience from the clinic to the clinic. And I think that really captures what we do. So we started out more or less as a commercial entity. Uh, we had a several spin-offs. Uh, quite successfully as well. Uh, and two years ago, we decided to also transform uh, Brain Clinics into the Brain Clinics Foundation, uh, which is a completely nonprofit organization. I don't get any payment salary, so there's no financial uh, yeah, conflicts of interest there. Uh, and we really want to yeah, uh, focus solely on that mission of, of getting personalized medicine out there. Got it, got it. Wow, man, this is impressive. I, I, as the layman of the group, would like to ask one question, and then I am going to hang up and listen to my answer, and then let the doctors go at it, and, and Jay. Uh, the NFL, the National Football League, has their draft uh, a, a week from today, I believe, and there's a quarterback from Ohio State named Justin Fields. It just came out in the news that uh, – He's been diagnosed with epilepsy. This is somebody that was probably going to be the third pick, and maybe he'll drop down because of this. 
Uh, when you drop down from the third pick to whatever, I mean, we're talking millions of dollars. Can we just touch on what epilepsy is and how does neurofeedback come into play? How does it show in the QEEG? I'll let you guys go and then skip. You, you take on after that. What do you think? Sure, that works for me. All right. So what, what is epi epilepsy and then how will that affect an NFL football player like Justin Fields? Uh, I'm hanging up and listening for my answer. I think that's the one of the best for you today, Jay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is not an unusual circumstance. Uh, the number of people that have epilepsy exceeds the number of people that you might think have epilepsy. It's, it's a relatively common uh, circumstance. And unfortunately, only about a third of the epileptics uh, have well-controlled uh, uh, epilepsy with medication. And another third have some benefit, but a third of the people with the diagnosis have uh, no benefit whatsoever from the medical interventions. And they're considered intractable epileptics. Now, I don't think that the professional football player is necessarily um, having hundreds of seizures a day like some of the totally intractable epileptics do. Um, but uh, uh, with the diagnosis itself, it's still unfortunately quite a pejorative. Um, it, it, it's a negative strike against you uh, for employment, uh, government contracts. Um, and it, it, it's really unfortunate because uh, the, the individuals are um, uh, uh, quite often extraordinary. Uh, if you look at the uh, history of individuals that have been uh, historic figures that have had epilepsy, it's, it's rather striking how many of them were uh, truly creative and extraordinary individuals contributing uh, to, to our current uh, you know, state of knowledge. So um, uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, epilepsy is uh, that an actual uh, uh, strike against you. Uh, it, it's unfortunately quite disturbing to have seizures. Um, I just finished uh, the sixth case uh, in a row uh, of intractable epileptics that I've worked with. <clears throat> and uh, one of them is, a, is a, an athlete. Uh, so it's somewhat analogous to your uh, uh, pro uh, uh, football player. Um, uh, at eight years old, she was diagnosed with ADD here in the U.S. Um, they actually did an EEG which showed epileptiform discharges, but the therapist didn't share that medical opinion with the parents. And uh, they, they treated her for her ADD, which had some improvement, but not full remediation. Um, they then moved over to Europe. Now she had been playing tennis as a young girl and quite good at it. Um, and, uh, uh, but she started having uncontrolled seizures they first noticed it with a little flickering of the eyes and, and a, a blank stare. Uh, but eventually she was having up to 250 um, generalized, what, what are considered tonic-clonic seizures. What, what you usually think of as an epileptic is somebody thrashing on the ground. Well, that's the kind of seizures she was having, but she had other kinds as well. Um, uh, the doctors couldn't stop it with three medications, and that's as many as they wish to give generally. Um, and uh, we, we um, you know, got the referral at that point. Uh, the, the parents wanted to try neurofeedback because the doctors were suggesting removing uh, a large portion of a right temporal lobe. Um, it actually turns out that the right temporal discharge, although it was very large and obvious, was not the trigger. Uh, and they could have removed that right temporal lobe and it wouldn't have stopped her seizures. Uh, the left side was where it was being triggered. So uh, we, we trained her with neurofeedback uh, for about a, a full four years, uh, hundreds of training sessions uh, managed at home. Um, the, the mother was a, 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 a PhD psychologist uh, with some training in uh, ADD, ADHD treatment. Uh, so uh, she gained a little bit more knowledge on how to work with uh, epilepsy. But uh, after a few hundred training sessions, she was medication free and seizure free. Wow. And her tennis game was still quite extraordinary. She's now a division one tennis star here in the United States, um, having uh, uh, moved back over to the US from uh, Barcelona. So um, 
it, it, it's entirely possible to be an elite athlete um, and, and control your epilepsy. Uh, and medications are advisable uh, if they work, but if they're not working, they're you know, potentially hazardous and you, you, know, you still need control. And neurofeedback is an alternative way to control epilepsy. Um, and Martine's a, a really good at identifying efficacy for neurofeedback. What, you know, back when I was president, I was upset with the number of people that were saying, oh, we can treat that, whatever was being discussed, oh, we can treat that. And uh, Martine's done some very good publications uh, showing what actually had efficacy quality research and uh, what we could make claims based on. And um, I, I'd like him to actually discuss that a little bit. Um, uh, your your uh, friend with epilepsy, in fact, could be treated uh, to uh, enhance his control, uh, which he's undoubtedly getting medication for. And that doesn't always help your game. Yeah, that's, I think, I mean, I mean, especially for a debilitating disorder like epilepsy, I mean, there's pretty good evidence, actually. That's how the whole field started about, well, uh, what was it, uh, 50, 60 years ago, uh, with the first accidental finding of Barry Sturman in cats who find the, uh, uh, the uh, anti-convulsant effects of SMR neurofeedback. And I think indeed, then, like the cases you described, I mean, they are around. However, I think we also need to consider that that's not the, the typical story. I mean, the latest uh, meta-analyses on epilepsy show, yes, there is a definite effect. Uh, but the likelihood, with standard protocols at least, uh, of becoming seizure-free is like 5 or 10%. And the majority will indeed get some symptom relief, but getting seizure-free just by neurofeedback, uh, and, and I'm mentioning standard protocols because uh, the difference here is that I think if Jay looks at the EEG and comes with recommendation, that's probably not a standard protocol. And I do think that, that that could have a bit more potency, uh, but at least standard protocols and standard studies are showing some good effect. And indeed, I think with neurofeedback, and I think that's also one of the reasons, because I often got asked the question, I mean, how can it be that we have this hopefully powerful treatment uh, that's been around for 50 years, but it never has made a breakthrough. It never made it to the main stage. It's still not accepted by psychiatrists or psychologists uh, as an evidence-based kind of treatment. And we've worked a long time uh, towards that goal. For example, in my own view, I think the application in ADHD is beyond any doubt uh, is very effective and I'm stressing the word effective. Uh, I will touch more on that later. And in some meta-analysis, we actually demonstrated that. But I think what the main setback in the field is that if you simply start Googling, and I think even the Netherlands are the most notorious for it. And if you start Googling for neurofeedback, you find all these websites. And it seems like it's almost a competition. Who has the longest list on the website with indicated claims? Neurofeedback works for, and it starts with all kinds of indications up to autoimmune diseases and what have you. And that, I think, is the biggest problem we have in our field because it's unregulated, because people do not even need to have any papers to be able to practice neurofeedback, and because people can claim whatever they want. Any critic person looking outside in will think like, hey, well, if it sounds like, uh, like fish oil, uh, like, uh, how do you say it? it probably, snake, it's snake oil. Snake oil. <laughs> if, it's, yeah. if it sounds like snake oil, it probably is. And that perception, I think, is the strongest uh, thing we have, uh, the strongest thing we have against us. And that's most of the people uh, in the neurofeedback field to blame to some degree. And so we've conducted quite some meta-analysis, the first one in 2009. And I think one I would like to highlight particularly is because even if you would consider neurofeedback uh, to be expensive, and uh, is it really the EEG feedback that is involved? And that is something that I'm questioning myself at this point in time to some degree. We, can discuss it if you like uh, but then still the, the the fact of the matter is if it's a treatment based on operant conditioning and if you can achieve benefit and the benefit will be lasting for at least two years or even longer then honestly i don't care what is the active ingredient within this multimodal treatment but it is an effective treatment that results in long-term symptom relief and the last meta-analysis we did actually very nicely shown that uh, we had a group of critical people, including some people that have published uh, that, that neurofeedback was, was not that effective in the past. So we had a, a mixed group of P 
people pro and, and against, so to say. We had to agree on all the uh, conclusions we drew. And we focused the meta-analysis not on the question, does neurofeedback work? But what is the efficacy of a one-time neurofeedback treatment after 12 months of time, after follow-up? And so the primary endpoint was not after treatment, but after follow-up. So we found about 10 controlled studies, 10 randomized controlled studies in the treatment of ADHD. And actually we find that nicely that all the control groups, because the, the ingenious control groups that people have designed for neurofeedback are very wide, ranging from attention training, uh, muscle tension, biofeedback, and, and, and the likes. All the control groups were not showing any benefit after follow-up, not significant. The active control groups, which were mostly methylphenidate or Ritalin studies, were indeed showing some benefit. Numerically, it tended to taper off with follow-up. That's something we know, that the long-term use of psychostimulants uh, will have fewer effects in the longer term. And the beautiful thing is that neurofeedback was actually showing, without any exception, an, an, an enhancement of clinical benefit after follow-up without any treatment in the meantime. And so the beautiful thing about neurofeedback is you can train some, someone's brain activity with the multimodal package surrounding it, and the benefits will be improving with time, even when you don't do anything. And that's really proof to me that no matter what the working mechanism is, it is really a valuable treatment for children that need appropriate care. And so it's indeed a one-time investment with a longer-term outcome. Now, you're from the Netherlands, and everybody over there rides bikes, don't you? Um, yep. when, you were, when you were a young kid, your dad probably had to hold the seat on your bike and run along uh, so you learned how to balance and ride a bike. Now, when you were effectively not falling over, your dad kind of quit running along holding the bike. But you practiced that skill and you got better at it. And, you know, I've seen people in the Netherlands riding no-handed. Yeah, you know, I did that too here in the U.S., you know, um, uh, but your your skill when practiced cons continues to consolidate as a better and better skill with more and more practice. And I think neurofeedback is very much like that. It's a skill, an internal skill, not bike riding, but it's an internal skill that you've learned. And as long as you're doing it, you're going to eventually do it no handed. And um, uh, uh, by the way, I do appreciate the, uh, the, the Netherlands uh, bicyclists. Uh, other than running into tourists who are not walking around with their uh, head out, uh, the, 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 it, it's, a, it's a pretty effective circumstance. They, they don't mandate uh, helmets and uh, elbow pads and all this kind of stuff. Uh, people are actually pretty good at riding bikes and interacting with with us each other in a civil way. I don't see people yelling and screaming and he honking horns. Uh, that, that would be the United States. So um, I think anyway, the, I, I think uh, the analogy, that's, that's the analogy I, I like to use. And I think a second aspect of the analogy is maybe even more important, especially for the people at home. We often get asked the question, well, I mean, so what do I need to do? People are hooked up for neurofeedback. And the first question is, well, what do I need to do? And actually, there has been research. The only proper instructions for at least SMR neurofeedback is, I'm not allowed if I make, have to, can make a, a, an advertisement, but the answer is just do it. And that's actually a study that investigated it. And I think the analogy of the bike riding it illustrates that as well. Um, and like you say, I mean, my dad didn't tell me, okay, Matai, now you go out and now you tense this muscle, you relax that muscle and, you, and then specifying in an anatomical way what I should do to ride a bike. I mean, that, that didn't work. It's by falling, tripping down and, and going on the bike again by simply doing it. It's learning by doing. And that analogy, I think, also nicely illustrates that that takes the mystery out of neurofeedback a little bit as well. And of course, I mean, another thing is, and we talked about the DSM and how behavior maps very poorly on brain activity. Well, same here. People shouldn't stick to strategies or be told too much about what to do, because actually clinging too much on a strategy can hinder and impair the amount of learning uh, in your feedback. And so I think it's very important for people to consider that as well. Uh, and finally, I always tell people like, well, if I could tell you what to do to control it, well, that's called psychotherapy. Then we don't, don't, don't need the EEG to go along with that anyway. And so yeah. I think it's, it's a good analogy and we use it very often. 
Yeah. And, and talk therapy isn't really terribly effective for ADD, ADHD, is it? You know, so uh, um, I, 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 I agree with your analogy uh, uh, fully and um, uh, appreciate the fact that you've brought in, um, I, I, I wouldn't say um, against EEG neurofeedback, but more um, uh, simply uh, objectively looking for the evidence. Um, as an exam example, Sandra Liu, uh, who's uh, brilliant, and uh, uh, sh she's a, a, a PhD researcher at UCLA's uh, Semmel Research, the psychiatry department at UCLA. And uh, she was uh, working with Barclay, um, who, who was being paid by Ritalin um, uh, initially, and they, they were very much against neurofeedback at that point. Um, but she's a scientist and is open to, to data. And obviously working with her, uh, looking at the actual data, you've gotten her conclusion to be the same as your conclusion, that there is efficacy. No, Martin, true. if I could jump in, and I think we're I think we're right there. This is Skip, by the way, uh, Alaska, USA, and the general practices over here, which I know you're aware of. But you know, we have the traditional Western medical model, which tends to look at symptoms and and treat symptoms, and then we have you know big pharma's contribution as well as our categorization symptom, which is our system, which is the DSM. And we, you know, usually take at least a minute or two every show to bash the DSM. So maybe this is that minute, but feel free to take your own minute if you'd like. But what I'm, I'm working towards here and what I was excited about, you know, in reading your bio is, is your approach at being able to look at EEGs and maybe tailoring treatment to actually what's going on for folks neurologically and so if you could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. But also I'm, I'm hoping that's an opening for you to discuss your stratified psychiatry because I'm pretty interested to hear what that's all about too. Yeah, thanks for asking. I think, I think it's a really good one. I think upfront, especially for the people listening that are very known within your feedback field, I want to make a very important distinction between what I call on one hand QEG-based neurofeedback. Many people do that. And to be honest, and not sure what Jay thinks of it, but I would often consider that a chasing the red dot experience. People take QEG and uh, by kind of raw shot interpretation of the nice topo plots, they say, oh, there's the biggest red dot. Let's chase that one, train it down or train it up. And that's what they do uh, without understanding what's the location, what's the frequency, is it artifact, is it real, etc. And uh, okay, I plead guilty. We started a little bit that was our initial understanding as well, that it's about something that needs to deviate. And if there's a deviation, you want to use the bulldozer approach to normalize it. It's not that simple. And so it's been a long time, especially a long time learning from Jay, who put a lot of pieces of the puzzle together in my view. And we've set out to test many of those as well. But our current approach uh, to QEG and, and treatments is actually much simpler. Uh, we've come to realize that we shouldn't make it too difficult because we cannot do an NS1 neuroscience study every time over and over again, understanding the whole complexity within an individual. What we've come to realize, if you look at neurofeedback, there's three protocols that we know have enough substantial evidence behind them. And that's theta-beta neurofeedback, that's SMR, sensory motor rhythm and neurofeedback as originally developed by Barry uh, by, um by Barry Sturman, and there's a slow cortical potential neurofeedback, which is more the, the German uh, development uh, by Niels Bierbaumer and, and uh, Ute Streel and Hartmut Heinrich. And so there's these three protocols, and they all have very nicely designed and well-powered studies behind them. So we know that on the group level, they all have quite similar efficacy. And I can give you a sim the same example for depression and depression treatments. On the group level, you will see that they're all quite identical. So if we now do this thought experiment, if I take a dice and I say, uh, if I throw a one, uh, it will be SMR, a two will be theta beta, and a three will be uh, SCP neurofeedback, then I, I probably will not do any harm by rolling the dice and assigning someone to a treatment based on, based on, on a random number, right? And because the individual contribution will be identical. But we do know that we might increase the likelihood of someone actually learning something if we increase the signal to noise ratio, for example. And secondly, uh, I might have 
preconceptual kind of uh, hypothesis about what a specific pro protocol can do. So actually, when we dumb it very, drill it down to what we actually do, the QEG informed neurofeedback as opposed to QEG based neurofeedback mainly comes from a signal to noise ratio perspective. We look at a QEG, if someone doesn't have an excess of theta, well, why should I start with theta beta neurofeedback? Doesn't make sense, right? So then theta beta is out of the window. Then the second question we'll ask is, well, what's happening with sleep? We know that 70% of the unmedicated kids and adults with ADHD have a sleep problem that's actually taking them more than 30 minutes to fall asleep, a so-called delayed sleep phase syndrome uh, or circadian rhythm sleep disorder. And we know that if you take longer to fall asleep, but your alarm clock goes off at the same time, and we know that you will be missing out on sleep. And that in a chronic fashion can actually cause your inattention and impulsivity uh, issues. Well, then it makes a lot of sense that a protocol like SMR would be the right protocol for specifically that subgroup of patients. And this is very old, there's nothing new. Barry Sturman already demonstrated in his cats that if you train SMR, they sleep much sounder, sleep spindle density goes up, and there's a sounder sleep. And so that could be a decision to pick that protocol, assuming that there's no excess theta. And if there's, for example, low alpha activity, uh, then, or there's some, uh, some activity like mu rhythm activity that might be too close to the SMR band to train, then you can opt for slow cortical potential neurofeedback. So to cut a long story short, that's where this is a, a one minute or a five minute explanation, how you can stratify it to a specific protocol. And here's the beauty. We now just published uh, a couple of months ago, uh, a replication because we proposed this in 2012 and shown that the effect size was quite high, remission rates of uh, 50 to 60%, where psychostimulants remission rates, not response, or around 40, 40%. And now we've independently replicated with data from three different clinics that the same QEG informed approach uh, is indeed having the exact same efficacy in a newly acquired sample of over a hundred people. And so we see effect sizes of 1.5 to 1.8. We see remission rates of 55%. So, I mean, how difficult can it be? So, so I think that, that also ties into the, the stratified psychiatry approach. While I think that in the future, uh, we would like to look at an individual EEG with a genome scan and all the biological metrics we can acquire and really individualize someone's treatment, uh, which if, in very simplistically put means that an ADHD patient that presents to me could walk out with an antidepressant. I think that indeed there are some truths towards the future in that. However, we currently do not have the evidence. We don't get the FDA approval, and this is considered off-label usage. So if we can still personalize and individualize and remaining on-label, uh, then I think, think that's a much safer way to go. And that's actually someone we're, something we're working on as well. We currently have uh, a lot of follow-up work on one of the biomarkers, one of the most profound biomarkers we worked on with Jay, the alpha frequency. And interestingly, the alpha frequency is now shows up that if it's too slow, you will not respond to methylphenidate, but you will respond to neurofeedback. And we think you might also respond to atomoxity. And this is something we're putting together in a replicated fashion. Stay tuned, probably a couple of months before it's published, but in a large replicated study. So that means that we have signposts. Hey, you walk, walk to the doctor, you take your EEG, you take with this brain activity, you take a right turn to neurofeedback, and with this brain activity, you take a left turn to methylphenidate. And I think that's really, remember what our mission at Brain Clinics was, opt optimizing treatments that makes a benefit for patients tomorrow, not within a year or 10 years. And I think personalized medicine is definitely something that we're pursuing, but it's not around the corner. We cannot implement that for the average patient around the corner uh, tomorrow. So that's why we come in with stratified psychiatry. Okay, one, thanks. And I just had a quick follow-up. I know Laura has a question too. With just you, you live in the the Netherlands, right? So, um, what's what's the atmosphere on this personalized medicine? I know here it's you know it, it's not accepted. It, it it's not here yet by a large degree. Is there just a different mindset where you are, where that's more amenable? where it would make sense, where it would fit to how you approach medicine. And that's just, I know, a wide net question, but I'm, I'm curious, is it different 
where you are acceptance wise than it is over here? Well, yes and no. I think, I mean, overall, <clears throat> personalized medicine is still a dream. Even stratified psychiatry is a dream. And uh, the term stratified psychiatry, I mean, you can Google it, but in the, the way we mean it, I think there's no one really, that that's really new. Uh, because it's a bit simpler. So we have a long job to do educating reviewers and scientific journals, what we ex actually imply with it, and also the ethical side of it. Because remember that the ethics for biomarker-driven research are important. Let's assume that I have now discovered an EEG biomarker that is above 80% specific. And so I can very reliably identify 80% of the people that will not be responding to my treatment. And let's now assume that my false positive rate is about 20%. Can I pull the trigger and I'll tell, you, tell a patient uh, that, that meets a, a, a no response kind of criteria, can I tell him like, well, you can't get the treatment, even though there is a 20% likelihood they might respond. Ethically, that's a dilemma you can take. And that's where using the biomarker to take a right or left turn is ethically a completely different kind of an implementation and something we can do. And so while Everyone is open-minded about personalized medicine. Everyone would like to see it happen. I don't think the evidence uh, is there yet, uh, but that's where I think the stratified psychiatry uh, is something that's, that could change that acceptance rate. And we actually have just done in a very large uh, psych psychiatry clinic in the Netherlands, a first prospective trial that was in depression. And so we actually wanted to do a feasibility to test how open-minded psychiatrists would be in taking an EEG-based recommendation for medication. It was intended as feasibility because if you compare to active treatments, you need very large sample sizes. Well, actually, it turned out that feasibility was not an issue. They all loved the fact that we could inform based on the EEG to pay, pick antidepressant A, B, or C. And actually, there was a significant enhancement of clinical response as well. We saw that the remission almost doubled. And so I think that's a nice example that the adoption by psychiatrists will not be an issue at all, uh, but it's about getting enough evidence altogether, which requires tremendous collaboration among professionals and data sharing among people as well, which I think is crucial. Thank you. Um, Martijn, uh, who, who pays for this research? Uh, for the research we do. You do? Okay, so out of your pocket. Uh, well, so the question is for the research at Brain Clinics, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, various things. I mean, starting in, in the big early days, we uh, had to, we worked together with Brain Resource, and that, that's more like the QEG processing. Uh, so I have part of the, 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 the stuff we've done is the QEG processing service uh, that many people use, make use of. Uh, we facilitate people if they want to set up QEG. We help them and advise them. So a lot of it's consultancy. A lot of it's contract research. And like with the iSpot trial, uh, we also just finished a neurofeedback trial for Ergotech, which was a uh, home-based uh, neurofeedback device for uh, treating sleep problems. Um, and so we facilitate to contract research uh, and those kind of things. Those are the main, the main drivers, facilitating applied research. That's great. Yeah. So uh, me and Skip are neuropsychologists. Um, I, I live near Chicago and Skip's out in Alaska, as he said. And I was looking at your webpage there. So I'm just kind of curious, how does neuropsychology work in the Netherlands? I, I noticed that they have a, a tablet that they do a lot of the neuropsych testing. How, how is that going and how does it kind of correlate with what you're seeing with the EEGs? Yeah, it's funny you ask. We have been using, it's called the Intec Neuro, that's a touchscreen based uh, neuro, neuropsych assessment that has been from the beginning paired with the uh, EEG assessments. Um, we still use it, but to be honest, I use the neuropsych uh, outcomes. We use it more to get a more global picture of the patient. Unfortunately, in all the stratification we have been looking at, uh, whether it could be helpful in personalizing treatments, to be honest, we haven't found too much success yet. I think the only uh, more basal kind of informative uh, data we get is, for example, with the oddball or with the working memory uh, or one back task, yeah, the, the number of false positive, false negative errors or omission commission errors. Those have been quite informative in guarding the level of impulsivity uh, and inattention. But I, we haven't found too many um, predictive power of the neuropsychology yet. So it's more generally descriptive and informing us about, about the patient. 
So you're saying that about the, the computerized tablet. Um, how about with like traditional neuropsych testing? So yeah, me and Skip, we still do the, the paper and pencil and puzzle and all those kinds of things. Um, do you guys integrate that kind of information? No, we only rely on the, uh, on the uh, automated neuropsych assessment, which I think is, is, uh, is probably a bit more accurate. I mean, I think the reaction times, uh, the standard deviations you get, I think are probably a bit more reliable because it's all really, really standardized. Mm -hmm. Of course, when there are specific suspicions of, um, of specific cognitive complaints, uh, we might require follow up on that. Uh, but it's not something, at least not from my perspective, I think the clinicians next door, uh, they will use that information more. But in the research, we've not been uh, using that, that uh, too much. Okay, sold. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, one of the nice things uh, that, that's happened with some of my clients is that they've actually gone back and looked at the outcomes of their uh, reports and treatments. And one of the things uh, I've had one client who actually went to the trouble of de-identifying almost 2000 cases of that we work together with him on now and uh, got IRB access to researchers to access that data. Uh, Martine uh, approached uh, us and asked for access to it, looking for the uh, neurocognitive or behavioral correlates of beta spindles uh, in the EEG. And that corresponds with insomnia, uh, independent of the DSM uh, categorization. Uh, so uh, actually looking at the data uh, itself is, has uh, come in handy. One of the other things that we looked at is treatment recommendations. Um, in psychiatry, there are clients that have epileptiform content in their EEG that are non-epileptic. And if you go to a neurologist with those, the absolutely abnormal EEG discharge and say, doc, look at this, it's an epileptiform discharge. I say, yep, it's an epileptiform discharge. They say, well, can you give an anticonvulsant medication to my patient? And they will say these exact words, we don't treat the EEG, we treat the patient. My response is always, well, who do you think made this EEG? Um, because the, you know, the, this is actually an, an abnormal discharge and uh, warrants an anticonvulsant to stabilize it. Now in psychiatry, they don't have the same standard of practice. They can actually give an anticonvulsant on an empirical trial basis. Uh, they've tried one med, it didn't work, tried another, it didn't work. Well, try this one and see if it works. Um, we actually tried that. And with an N of 76 patients that were psychiatric patients with no history of seizure, with epileptiform content in the EEG, what happens when you give them an anticonvulsant? Now, it isn't like their seizures stop because they didn't have seizures. What happens? 85% of them, and in a clinical study, 85% success is crazy high. 85% of them improve psychiatrically when you stabilize their EEG. The epileptiform content was contributing to their clinical picture. When you stabilize that, they improve. So evidence-based medicine, personalized medicine, um, there's the evidence 85% of the time, if you treat a uh, psychiatric patient who has got epileptiform content and you can only tell that if you look, um, you, you're gonna end up with clinical benefit. Now, of the patients that had uh, uh, worsening, um, there were only five patients that got worse. Three of those, the worsening was basically a negative response to the anticonvulsant, a fever or a rash, and you had to stop the anticonvulsant. But those were classified as a, a negative outcome. So uh, um, probably the negative outcome was overestimated, but that, you know, just, that was the standard we set up at the start. So we live with. If I, if I can add to that, because I think that's one of the most fascinating examples, and you know, we, we took it from you as well, like you know, there can be subgroups of psychiatric patients that have epileptiform EEG, but don't have epilepsy. And Nash Boutros is also uh, another specialist who's been advocating that for quite a bit, and his best example, I think, is in panic attacks, that people have panic disorder, yeah. and their panic attacks are having a waxing and waning very unexpectedly. You cannot infer it from the psychological, uh, yeah, environmental factors. And he actually found that some of those patients, again, we always talk about subgroups, right? Actually had, had seizure-like activity. And when he treated them as seizure-like, 
eh, with an anticonvulsant, they would respond very well. So we've taken that idea and actually we worked also with Nash uh, in the iSpot trial, which was like a, an over a thousand sample size of depressed patients. And we asked the question exactly as Jay phrased it as well, could it be eh, that if we have met patients with a depression and if we start looking at their EEG, those people that have epileptiform EEG, we would then predict that they would be less likely to respond to a standard antidepressant. And was indeed the question we had was like, well, maybe they might benefit better for augmentation with an anticonvulsant. So here's the interesting thing. The first part of the answer, we use three types of medication. We have escitalopram, sertraline, and fenlafaxine, very commonly used antidepressants. And the interesting thing was that our hypothesis was confirmed for escitalopram and for fenlafaxine. And so in those two drugs, if you present with an epileptiform EEG, you were three times less likely to achieve remission after treatment. And so very clinically useful. But here's the kicker. And this is again, the stratification approach we came across. We actually found that for sertraline, the trend was opposite. So for sertraline, which is also an SSRI, we find that the more abnormal the EEG is, the better patients respond. So we then did a follow-up study that we looked at, okay, what happens after eight weeks? So we looked at those people who, for, for whom the EEG normalized, who were not showing any longer epileptic form activity. And we found that exactly those were the, the ones that had a normalized EEG uh, in the sertraline group, were five, five times more likely to be re, uh, remitted and, and responded to treatment. So actually demonstrating that sertraline also clinically changed the underlying EEG. And so we've actually now reclassified sertraline to be a mild anticonvulsant. And what's the beauty about this is because I agree with Jay that you should maybe consider an anticonvulsant, yeah, but this makes it much wider applicable because we can now remain within the class of antidepressants and again, have the signpost going right or left, say, hey, if you have a normal EEG, well, uh, acetylopram and phenylphexine might be a good choice. However, if you have EEG abnormalities, you might better respond to sertraline. And so again, a beautiful example of within class treatment stratification based on the EEG. Is, is it for absence seizures also? No, I think, with the, yeah, we didn't classify, I mean, of course, remember, uh, epilepsy was an exclusion. So none of them had epilepsy and none of them, of course, had absence seizures. Uh, again, I'm not a neurologist. I can't tell myself what an absence seizure looks like in the EEG. Maybe Jay can comment that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't comment on that in detail. Yeah, let, let me, uh, and I, I do want to hear from Jay. So Pete kind of wants us to loop, um, you know, our, our listeners, you know, together. We, we definitely have uh, technicians and uh, uh, neurofeedback specialists, but we also have parents. And so I, I think what's, what's important about what we're talking about in terms of parents who want to bring their kids in for help, that there is such a thing as an absence uh, seizure. And, you know, so seizures, generally speaking, and I'm just going to kind of water it way down, is, is there's an unusual electrical activity in the brain. And... Um, in with you know extremely you know high uh, voltage or high um, amplitude and and you know Pete wants to uh, express what the the maps look like well they they look like headlights uh, Martine talked about chasing the red dot well the, the whole brain's a red dot uh, when when you have seizures um, uh, but but the absence seizures um, have to do with just in terms of uh, behavioral description of children. And I think this is important because parents will bring in kids with ADHD questions. You know, they're staring off, they're they're not paying attention, this kind of stuff. And so it can be, yeah, the the high theta uh, beta ratios. You know, a lot of slow activity in the front, and, and that can look a lot like uh, ADHD. But with absent seizures, it is a leptiform activity that um, is is specific to this type of seizure where kids are staring off. And so we have to make you know. Uh, the distinction of kind of what are we looking at, and often the EEG can help us kind of pick that out. Jay? A classical absence seizure is a three per second spike in wave, and it's frontally prominent, but it's generally actually triggered from the temporal lobe. Uh, the, the big voltage discharges up front, but they're, again, the, they're, they're generally triggered by a temporal lobe issue. Now, uh, um, the three per second spike in wave, gen if it's classic, it generally goes away in your late teens. 
And if you're looking at a research with adults with depression, you're not going to get a whole bunch of that class of individuals into your study. Um, and yeah, it isn't like people under 18 can't be depressed and on an antidepressant. But if you're doing research, most of your uh, m most of your subjects are going to be adults. Um, uh, uh, I have to say that that uh, uh, unexpected epileptiform content in the EEG was the number one predictor of medication failure in psychiatry. Uh, Mark T Martin's aware of the customer of mine, Ron Swatsina, uh, who, who de-identified all these uh, cases. And once he got IRB approval to access the data, he said, well, Jay, what, are we gonna, what, what should we look for in our first study? I said, well, your doctor is a specialist who receives medication failure clients from other doctors. Pull the medication failure clients out. And there were over 300 of them. And look at what are the EG features that are in these patients that are medication failures? And um, uh, use a cluster analysis and add another cluster and then add another cluster and add another cluster until the clusters don't make sense. I mean, then back up one, you know, uh, you, you went one step too far if the clusters don't make sense. And epileptiform content was the number one predictor of medication failure. Beta spindles, which Martine researched for insomnia, was the number two predictor. Uh, low voltage, slow EEG, which is actually a metabolic marker, uh, probably something other than your usual psychiatric patient, uh, somebody that has a toxic or metabolic issue. And then finally, somebody with a, a focal problem and a focal slow wave or a focal uh, discharge of some sort. If, if you've got a focal problem, it's not your usual psychiatric patient. And uh, looking at those four biomarkers, you identify almost every single one of the cases that are having difficulty with me getting medicated effectively in psychiatry. Jay or, or Martin? Yeah, sorry, Pete. I mean, I'm answering what I think you're asking. Is there a way, again, for the parents at home, non-clinical folks, just to simply describe what, what's going on when a seizure is happening? I mean, I, is that possible? I, I could take a stab at that. Um, uh, in an absence epilepsy, as an example, the, the size of the discharge in the front of the head can be 500 to 1,500 microvolts, gigantic voltages. Now, if you're processing uh, a perception, you might have a five to 10 microvolt size of the event-related potential. And that information is going to have to be kind of processed around through the various networks. And when the frontal lobe has a 500 microvolt to 1,500 microvolt signal, that signal is noise and the signal you're trying to process is going to be overwhelmed by the noise. Your signal to noise ratio is going to be terrible. You can't track what's going on when your frontal lobe is being hit by a thousand microvolts of noise when your signal is only 10 microvolts at its largest. So uh, the signal to noise ratio goes all to hell. You can't really track what's going on with your frontal lobe's attentional networks. The frontal lobe regulates in executive fashion your attentional skills. So uh, the frontal lobe gets hit with this and it hijacks your ability to attend for a brief period. Now, three per second spike in waves are usually brief events, a few seconds to maybe 10, 15 seconds. If they're longer than that, they're really quite extraordinary. But you can have a status, uh, I mean, a persistent long standing discharge as well. They're very rare. Um, other forms of epilepsy hijack function wherever they're located. As an example, uh, there, there's something that was usually referred to as a benign juvenile pattern where the epileptiform contents in the occipital area. And historically, they didn't treat it. It's, it's a benign pattern. Why do they call it benign? Well, they weren't having seizures. They were having epileptiform content, but no seizures. They have rare seizures. Generally, if they're going to have them, they're in their sleep. What they have is sensory distortions and hallucinations and you know, uh, uh, images, you know, flickery images and odd visual uh, f phenomenon. So if the discharge is in another network, it's going to have a negative impact on that network. Uh, so depending upon where the discharge is, it's going to have a totally different uh, effect. 
Um, and temporal lobe seizures quite seldom end up with full-blown convulsions. They can, but temporal lobe seizures usually are seen as emotional dysregulation, a, a rage event, a fit of anger. The term fit is not a politically correct term for epilepsy, but it's instructive, a fit of anger, a fit of laughter, uh, a pseudo bulbar affect uh, where, where the seizure discharge is actually mimicking uh, some emotion. So uh, depending upon where it is, it's going to mess up the function in that area. Now, obviously, if it's in the sen sensory motor strip, you can have you know, convulsions from it. Um, but if it doesn't involve the sensory motor strip, you can have something else disturbed by it without the convulsion. There are a lot of people that have psychiatric presentations that have epileptiform content in their EEG with no history of seizure. Probably never will have a seizure. Maybe, maybe not, but probably not. Thank you. Wow. That's great. The listeners got their money's worth this show. Holy cow. Martine, thank you for coming on the show. No worries. It was, was, uh, was glad to be here. Thanks for now, Jay, re Jay, Jay recommended you. Do you have somebody to recommend on the show that we could put on? Yeah, I would recommend Thomas Ross. I think one of the new, true, one of the true pioneers, I think really pioneering a lot of very exciting research uh, in the field of neurofeedback is Thomas Ross from uh, Geneva, uh, Switzerland. And I think he's been... I think he's one of the one of the, the cleverest neurofeedback researchers. I think, uh, yeah, at this at this point in time. All right, I'm going to reach out to him. I'm going to say Martine uh, told me to reach out, and if he doesn't get back to me, I'm going to sick Jay on him. <laughs> Martine, what's the, what's the best way for our listeners uh, to find out more about your business? Is it bra brainclinics.com? Is that the best way? Yeah, our website is www.brainclinics.com and there they can find lots of information. And maybe a small side note, we, we have a, an open access and sharing policy. So all the research we publish, you can download it for free from our website. Uh, actually, oh, wow. uh, we will be publishing, we're working on that. We will be releasing 12 to 1300 EEGs on our website as well for open access use for people to do research with full descriptors, diagnosis, outcomes. Oh, wow. Uh, because we get often requests that people do an AI study, uh, overfitting data, etc. Uh, and in order to facilitate that, we have decided to uh, publish the last two decades of EEGs we have collected in at Brain Clinics. That's called the two decades, decades uh, uh, brain day database. Uh, and it's open for anyone to use for, uh, for academic purposes. Well, we could test our technicians on those, the, the ones in training. I love it. That's, that's a fabulous thing to do. Uh, the difficulty is that AI will need hundreds of thousands of studies, not a thousand or more. I mean, big data isn't what we would consider big data. They need more like the amount of EEGs that I've looked at. Uh, the, if they had two or 300,000, they would be well along at figuring things out. Um, Stanford University uh, uh, accessed all of their digitally accessible EEGs. They had over 30,000 of them. Uh, and you think, well, that's a good start. But you have to realize those were clinical EEGs and those are all epilepsy or encephalopathy. There's no ADD, there's no depression, there's no autism. Yeah. The, the, all of the, the richness of the psychiatric DSM categories are missing other than epilepsy and encephalopathies. So um, th uh, they actually came to me and asked if they could get the data that we have. And I said, I'd be happy to give them to you, but they're not mine. They belong to my customers and their clients and I can't. I introduced them to a couple of customers that had large accounts, but um, they're, they're, you know, it's not my data to hand out. Uh, but I, 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 I appreciate your openness in, in sharing the data. Uh, it's what people need to be doing. Jay Martin, I know we're over time, but a quick question. Is it possible to go to like Dave Matthews and say, hey, man, come on in. We want to get a QEEG of your brain and then use that when uh, you have kids coming in wanting to be musicians. Do you think we can turn them into Dave Matthews or I'm way off base? Uh, no. I think you should invite Elon Musk and he'll probably talk about how to do that with the Neuralink. I think Neuralink. that's a little bit beyond our capacity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 
right. well if if you want to line up to have the 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 machine uh, stick what they call threads into your brain um uh, they'll they'll drill a hole uh, where they're going to stick the, uh, the the little computer chip, but they they stick threads across the cortex and the Elon threads Musk, have right? electrodes all the way along them. And the machine actually looks kind of like a cross between a sewing machine and a microscope. Yeah. Um, and I, Elon, uh, I, you know, I recommend brain surgery highly if you need it, but I don't know if I can line up for uh, the the them to, to I, stick uh, stick all that I, I in. Knew I, I, mean, I knew that's not that's not going to go anywhere. At, yeah. At least at the uh, end of the show. All right. Hey, hey, guys. We thank you for listening, Martin. Thank you again for coming on. Jay, thank you for joining us for a few shows. Oh man, this is this is great stuff. We thank you for listening to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, and Neuropsychology Podcast. Dr. Laura can be found at Jansons.com. Dr. Skip can be found at drskipren.com. Jay Gunkelman, well, there's only one Jay Gunkelman on Google. Trust me on that one. Idea <laughs> for a topic? Please email Pete at neuronoodle.com. And please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Smash that like button on Facebook, Instagram, and follow us on Twitter. If they can't hear us, we can't help them. Have a great weekend, everybody. Over Bye. and out. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Great job, great, Martin. Great to Thank see you, you again, Martin. Hey, thanks Jay, so much for nice seeing you guys. Get, get some sleep. I will <laughs> I always get, I get my eight hours every night, believe me. All right. And then Jay, you owe us another nine shows. So you stay healthy. Okay. Yeah, I'll do what I can to stick around. All right, buddy. Take care. All right, guys.